No chance, so that's what you got. Let's do another full faction timeline video, and this time we're going to look at a group that oddly doesn't get covered a whole lot on YouTube, but they were one of the WWF's biggest heel groups of the Attitude Era, and that's the Corporation. Vince McMahon's Corporation faction had a lot going for it. Here you have a group that centered around the power of a CEO and the unfair advantages that the owner of the business benefits from. It was pretty much perfect because on one side you had the good guys, the rebellious superstars of the Attitude Era who didn't fit the corporate mold like Stone Cold Steve Austin and D-Generation X, and on the other side you had the suits, the authoritative figures who wanted these rebels to conform to a more structured system where everyone falls in line and pretty much does whatever the chairman says. In a land where superstars flourished by not playing by the rules, the corporation were there to ruin all the fun, being the perfect villains during an era that was all about attitude and bucking the system. Let's go back in time and take a look at the corporation's entire run in chronological order. And just a fair warning here, this is only going to cover the corporation and not the corporate ministry. Today's video is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends, the free to play RPG game enjoyed by 80 million players around the world. One of the things I enjoy about the game is the sheer level of customization available. You can build unique teams, customize them with the best artifacts, choose their masteries and put them to the test in both single player and multiplayer. Raid's also holding a Champions Elect event. Download Raid from the links below, copy your in-game player ID, go to championselect.playrooms.com and stick your ID in. Vote for your favourite champion and that's all you need to do. All eligible entrants will be in with an opportunity to win awesome in-game and real life prizes including epic and legendary champions and Amazon gift cards worth up to $1000. Keep in mind that this event is only available to players in the US. Voting ends on February 10th when a champion gets crowned the winner and the prize winners will be selected via a draw. New players can also click the link in the description or scan the QR code to get bonuses worth $35. Free epic champion Jotun, 100k silver, 50 gems and 2 epic skill tomes. All your treasure can be found right here and it'll be available for 30 days. Thanks to Raid for helping to keep the lights on at Wrestling Bios. Most would point to the night after Survivor Series 1998 as the night the corporation formed and most would be absolutely right in doing so. But the idea of Vince McMahon wanting his superstars to play by the rules goes all the way back to Survivor Series 1997. We all know the story of the Montreal Screwjob, but remember, Brett didn't play by McMahon's rules and Brett didn't want to follow orders. McMahon may have legitimately screwed the hitman in Montreal, but he quickly turned this into a character trait for himself when he publicly said he wanted the title removed from Brett and that's exactly what he got. Realizing the fans absolutely hated his guts and realizing he may have just created the ultimate villain in himself, McMahon publicly announced on Raw that he didn't want Steve Austin to beat Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 14 either. Yes, this was more character based and scripted in comparison to the Brett Screwed Brett interview, but when McMahon said he didn't want Austin as WWF champion, we finally realized, without question, that the boss of WWF had his own preferences and regards to who represents his company, in a storyline sense anyway. If McMahon was going to be disliked by fans, the way he saw it, it was best to run with it and turn a negative into a positive. Both the casual audience and the smartened up audience didn't like Vince McMahon. So when you think about it, the Mr. McMahon character was one of the best villains WWF could present at that time and maybe the most complex. It was incredibly easy for Vince to blur the lines between reality and fiction and we saw this happen even when Vince was away from WWF TV screens. Anyway, Steve Austin won the WWF Championship and a rivalry began between Stone Cold and The Boss following WrestleMania 14. In very early into this rivalry, McMahon would get encouragement, assistance and his boots licked by three men, Gerald Briscoe, Pat Patterson and Commissioner Slaughter. This band of merry men were not known as the corporation, but they served as the nucleus of the faction. Mick Foley was associated with this group early on. McMahon envisioned Dude Love defeating Austin for the gold, but Foley was unsuccessful in doing so.
For a little reassurance when he was stuck in a wheelchair, Vince McMahon got himself a security guard. The guard kept his identity hidden at first, but fans quickly found out that the big boss man had returned to WWF and his new job was to protect Mr. McMahon at all costs while also basically doing his dirty work. This return did wonders for Ray Triller by the way, he floundered big time in WCW and this run he had in WWF would turn out to be leagues better than anything he did in Atlanta. Another man who became re-associated with Vince McMahon as 1998 continued on was Mick Foley. Vince envisioned Foley winning the vacant WWF Championship at Survivor Series 1998, but we also got the impression that Vince didn't really care too much about Mrs. Foley's baby boy. It felt like Vince was just using Mankind for his own personal benefit while Mick was excited to once again work directly under the chairman. Heading into Survivor Series in the deadly game WWF title tournament, McMahon's main goal was to keep the WWF championship away from Austin. Mankind was the chosen one who would hold the WWF title at the end of 1998, but fans were left shocked when Mr. McMahon screwed poor Mick out of the WWF championship. To stop Austin winning the WWF Championship, Shane McMahon turned heel at Survivor Series. Shane was a referee on this evening, assigned to the Women's Championship match between Sable and Jackie. Later on, Shane had a chance to count Mankind's shoulders to the mat when Austin covered Mick in a semi-final tournament match, but Shane sided with his daddy instead and Austin got eliminated from the tournament. While fans suspected that Vince wasn't all in when it came to Mankind, the majority of fans didn't expect The Rock to turn heel again because it at this point in his career, he was becoming extremely popular as a babyface. Vince told the timekeeper to ring the bell when Rock applied a sharpshooter on Mick Foley, so Vince screwed Mankind and Rock was now a heel WWF champion. In my opinion, Survivor Series 1998 featured one of the greatest swerves WWF ever pulled off. The Rock had not only become the champ for the first time in his career, but he also became the crown jewel of a new faction that would truly form the next night on Raw. Rock wasn't going to be the people's champion anymore, from Survivor Series onwards, The Rock would become known as the corporate champion. Stone Cold Steve Austin attacked Rocky at the very end of Survivor Series, so all signs pointed to a big Rock and Austin feud taking place in 1999. The Raw after Survivor Series was when Jim Ross unofficially called this group Team Corporate. Vince McMahon cut a promo at the very beginning of the show gloating about what happened the night before at Survivor Series and then he welcomed the corporate champion to the ring to say a few words. Keep in mind, at this point, there were only two full-time active wrestlers in the corporation, The Big Boss Man and The Rock, though by the end of this show the group would get another new member who would compete on weekly television. At the beginning of Raw, the corporation consisted of Vince, Shane, Patterson, Briscoe, Slaughter, Rock and The Boss Man. Rock said he didn't sell out by joining forces with McMahon, he just got ahead. Rock says he did what he had to do in order to stand in the middle of the corporate ring as WWF champion. The fans have to to work hard every day to get where they need to be just like Steve Austin, but the fans can keep their morality and honesty. It's all about Rocky getting to the top of the ladder. Rock didn't forget about these fans chanting Rocky sucks and die Rocky die back in 1997. So from now on, The Rock's gonna raise the corporate eyebrow and he's gonna drop the corporate elbow. Later on in the show, Ken Shamrock called out the big boss man. The boss man had caused Ken some issues in the run up to Survivor Series, and the world's most dangerous man wanted to settle things once and for all. During the match, both men decided to knock out the referee so they could continue fighting in the middle of the ring. Officials broke the pair up before Vince and Shane made an appearance, and McMahon offered Ken a spot in the corporation. Vince said he and Shamrock were a lot alike, they came from broken homes and they fought for everything they had. The people don't care about Shamrock, but Vince could really use someone like Ken in this new stable. A dangerous man to look out for Vince's best interests. And in return, Vince would give Ken something he never had. A family. A family that sticks together. Vince would have a corporate champion in The Rock, a corporate enforcer in The Big Boss Man, and Shamrock could be the corporation's dangerous man. It's not quite as good as the other titles, but yeah. So Vince offers Shamrock to come home to his new family, and just like that, Shamrock agrees to join Mr. McMahon's new faction. 
Later that night, Austin got a shot at Rock's WWF Championship, and both Shamrock and Big Boss Man were instrumental in making sure The Rock remained the corporate champion. The following week, Vince McMahon had a surprise for WWF fans. A new commissioner was arriving to the company by the name of Shawn Michaels, and Vince said HBK will not answer to Vinny Mac. When Michaels made his way to the ring for a promo, he made it clear that he wouldn't be siding with Vince's new evil faction, and instead, Shawn used his new power within WWF to book a WWF Championship match. The Rock was going to put his corporate championship on the line against Shawn's click buddy, X Pac, and the match was going to take place on Raw's War later in the evening. During the main event, HBK sent DX and the corporation back to the locker room, but you knew something was up when the new commissioner stayed at ringside for the match. And when Rock grabbed the steel chair to finish Axe Pac off for good, the Heartbreak Kid took the chair away, and he did the honors himself. Sean handed Rock a victory on Raw's War, and Sean made it clear he was now part of the corporation. Over the next few weeks, Sean would try to make life difficult for Axe Pac and D-Generation X. Sean said that HBK was DX before DX was cool, and it seemed like he had a chip on his shoulder in regards to Triple H's DX becoming a bunch of fan favourites. But unfortunately, Shawn Michaels wasn't able to continue on in his new commissioner role. He was still in a bad place personally, and he was still unable to control his addiction problems. So Shawn was kicked out of the faction on the final Raw of 1998, though he still would make odd appearances. In storyline, Vince explained that Shawn's recent actions didn't benefit the corporation. He even held the faction back while Mankind attacked Shane in the ring, so Shawn got fired and Vince got super kicked. The corporation got some new blood in the faction just before Shawn Michaels got kicked out. Andrew Tess Martin had debuted as a bodyguard for Motley Crue. Motley Crue had performed on Raw, in case you're wondering. But when Martin was ready to begin his work in the ring, he began his proper full-time run as a member of the corporation. Tess attacked Triple H on Raw, and the following week he teamed up with The Rock to wrestle Hunter and Axe Pac. Not a bad lineup for your first ever match on Monday Night TV. Being aligned with WWF's top heel faction at the time gave Tess's career a real boost from the get-go, and he immediately turned heads due to his look and his size. In the ring, there were a few things that could have been improved upon, but overall, adding a new guy like this just makes a lot of sense no matter what faction we're talking about. Mixing veterans with fresh talent really helps that fresh talent a lot, and we've seen it quite a few times over the years too. Tess could have easily remained the only big guy the corporation needed, but things got very interesting when Kane joined the corporation on the 21st of December 1998. Kane didn't join up to get ahead in life, he didn't join up so he could be part of a family. No, Kane joined up because Vince McMahon promised to keep him out of a mental asylum. During that Rock and Tess vs X-Pac and Triple H match, Kane showed his allegiance to the corporation by wiping out D-Generation X. But the week before that, the corporation were also instrumental in getting Kane taken away in a straitjacket. Basically, Vince McMahon would threaten to take Kane back to the asylum if he didn't join the corporation and do exactly what McMahon said. Vince would even use Kane to punish other members of the group such as Patterson and Briscoe, and if he didn't follow orders then he'd get committed and we'd never see the big red machine again. Kane would therefore remain a very unstable member of the group. If you want to watch a pay-per-view that features the corporation quite a lot, then check out the 1999 Royal Rumble. The faction had a pretty good night at this pay-per-view, and it's also a fun Attitude Era show with good matches and surprising results. On the first Raw of 99, Mankind defeated The Rock to become WWF Champion. So the Great One got a rematch at the Rumble, only this one would be contested under I Quit rules. The match Rock and Foley had here was extremely hard hitting. Mick Foley takes a ridiculous amount of chair shots to the head, and what's worse is the fact that his family was in the arena watching the match. You can see their reaction on the Beyond the Mat documentary, and as you'd expect, they were pretty distraught and pretty upset. The match is very gripping though, it's hard not to get engrossed in it when there's a man taking so much punishment over and over again. 
again. The Rock became the corporate champion once again at the Royal Rumble, even though Foley didn't really quit. And then, in the Royal Rumble match itself, the corporation got another huge win when Mr. McMahon won the whole thing. Yes, Vince McMahon won the Royal Rumble after entering at number 2. Steve Austin entered at number 1, and the match ended when The Rock distracted Stone Cold and Mr. McMahon dumped the rattlesnake out of the ring. Elsewhere on the card, the big boss man defeated the Road Dog, and Ken Shamrock made Billy Gunn top out, so the corporation had a really strong showing at the 1999 Royal Rumble, a Royal Rumble event that had the very apt subtitle of No Chance in Hell. The next night on Raw, Vince announced he was forfeiting his title shot at WrestleMania, and he planned on handpicking a replacement to pretty much ensure the title stayed within the corporation. But Commissioner Michael said the WWF rulebook states that the runner-up of the Royal Rumble is given the Mania title shot if the winner forfeits his main event opportunity. Even still, Austin wanted to give McMahon a chance to win the number one contendership back. All Vince had to do was beat Stone Cold in a steel cage match at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre pay-per-view in February. On the Raw after Royal Rumble, The Rock had another I Quit match, this time against Triple H. The corporation got involved and Kane got China up for a choke slam. The boss man told Triple H that if he says the words I quit, then Kane would let China go and that would be the end of the match. Triple H felt he had no choice, so he gave it up and Rock left Raw, still WWF champion. This was all a big setup though. China had joined the corporation and she made it clear when she hit Hunter with a low blow. This was big at the time. China had always been by Triple H's side, but now she was the first female member of the corporation and DX would carry on without one of their original members. China and Kane would develop an odd friendship during their time together in the corporation, and the WWF used this relationship to pull off a Another big swerve at WrestleMania 15. At the St. Valentine's Day Massacre cage match, Vince McMahon had a plan, a way he could beat Stone Cold and pull off another big upset victory. When the very fun cage match was coming to an end, the giant from WCW showed up from underneath the ring, and fans couldn't believe what they were seeing. Paul White was a former WCW World Champion, and he was heavily featured on WCW programming, and here he was, assisting Vince McMahon in a match against Steve Austin. Unfortunately for Vince, the sheer power of Paul White was very much underestimated. Paul threw Austin into the cage and a panel came off its hinges, leading to the whole side of the cage swinging open and Austin winning the match. It was a good finish I thought, but it also made Paul look a little… Uh, it seemed like it wasn't the smartest thing to do, you know, throwing a guy into the cage with that much brute strength. But the big show had arrived at the WWF and he was now part of the corporation. The Rock wasn't a big fan though. In February 1999, the corporation made its match. The Ministry of Darkness was another heel stable in WWF that was very instrumental in changing the corporation and eventually ending the storyline. The sinister Lord of Darkness Undertaker found McMahon's weak point, a very personal weak point that would introduce a new personality to WWF audiences, and that was Stephanie McMahon. The Undertaker would threaten to kidnap Stephanie, he would visit the McMahon home and cause Vince a lot of grief, and all this was going on while Vince had to focus on WrestleMania and his corporation hopefully leaving the big pay-per-view looking as dominant as possible. We'll come back to the ministry in a moment, but the corporation's storyline changed dramatically when The Undertaker got involved. WrestleMania 15 was a roller coaster night for the corporation. Paul White lost his match against Mankind, and when he was confronted by McMahon, he ended up punching out his boss, so that wasn't a great start. The Big Red Machine took on Triple H. That match came to an end when China turned her back on Kane while reuniting with Triple H and D-Generation X. Or at least, that's what we all thought. A little later on, Shane McMahon took on X-Pac with Shane O's European Championship on the line, and during this match, Triple H attacked X-Pac. So China didn't join DX once again, rather Triple H had joined the corporation, meaning DX no longer had their leader and the faction also didn't have any original members left. 
The Undertaker defeated the Big Boss Man in the first ever Hell in a Cell match to take place at WrestleMania, and Stone Cold defeated The Rock for the WWF Championship. So, the corporation gained quite a lot when Triple H joined up, but they also lost the WWF Championship, they lost Paul White, and The Undertaker was making the corporate team look pretty weak. Following WrestleMania, the corporation's main focus was shifted over to The Undertaker and the Ministry of Darkness. Vince McMahon would bring Stephanie to Raw for her own protection, a really stupid decision that backfired immediately when the Ministry managed to take Stephanie away momentarily, only for Ken Shamrock to find her later on. While this was all happening, Shane was getting a little more aggressive as a corporate leader while Vince was more focused on keeping his daughter safe. Vince wanted to stay backstage and keep things calm and he even told Shane to cool off a little but The Undertaker was coming on strong. The dead man was talking about a greater power, someone bigger than The Undertaker, someone above The Undertaker on the packing order, and whoever this was was going to appear soon in the WWF. The Lord of Darkness held a sacrifice in the arena while Stephanie and Vince watched backstage, and this was enough for Vince to finally concede and announce that his daughter's welfare was more important than the corporation and WWF. Shane wasn't happy about this, Shane felt that his dad was getting weak. He announced that this was a new young corporation that had new elite players such as the Main Street Posse, so Shane fired Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe before slapping his dad across the face. Later in the evening, Ken Shamrock was thrown out of the group because he got in Shane's face in regards to The Undertaker sacrificing his sister on Raw, so it seemed like the corporation, as we knew it, was falling apart quite rapidly. At Backlash 99, The Undertaker was finally able to abduct Stephanie McMahon and we got the famous line, where to Stephanie, to close out the show. The next night on Raw, even more changes happened to the corporation when The Rock left the group. He and Shane got into an argument about Rock's failure to win the WWF title the night before, and Tess was also kicked out of the faction after Shane ordered Bossman to attack the New Blood. Losing The Rock, in my opinion, really made the corporation feel a whole lot different, but it turns out there was a reason for all these guys suddenly leaving the faction, we'll get to that in a moment. The Undertaker was about to tie the knot with Stephanie McMahon to end the show in an unholy union, but Stephanie was saved by an unlikely hero, Mr. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Vince and Stephanie showed a great deal of gratitude towards Stone Cold for helping out, but there was still gonna be an unholy union happening on the pilot episode of Smackdown, one that would explain why so many people left the corporation. I should mention too that some of the guys who were kicked out of the corporation would form their own little group to try to take Shane and company down a peg or two. Test, John Rock, The Big Show, Mick Foley and even Vince McMahon would get together briefly to form the union stable. On the pilot episode of Smackdown, airing on the 29th of April 1999, Shane McMahon and the corporation interrupted a Vince and Stephanie promo. Shane O told his family to hit the bricks because he's got an announcement to make. Smackdown was gonna get headlined with a tag team match. The Rock and Stone Cold vs Triple H and anyone else who wanted to help take out Shane O's biggest enemies. The Undertaker appeared on the big screen and Taker accepted the available spot. A little later, Austin and Rock came out to cut a promo, but they too were interrupted by Shane McMahon, and it was here when Shane announced a merger. His plans were getting bigger and better, and to prove this, The Undertaker walked out and he stood beside the corporation's leader. The corporation then walked out along with the Ministry of Darkness, and Shane wanted to be the first to introduce audiences to this new faction named The Corporate Ministry. And that's where we end this faction timeline video. The corporation was no more and it was now a new faction headed by The Undertaker and Shane McMahon, for a few weeks anyway. If you want to continue on and check out what happened within the corporate ministry, you can look up the video I made on the subject quite a while back. It is an older video though, keep that in mind, but if I went on and talked more about the corporate ministry here, I'd just be repeating myself. The original corporation didn't last all that long really, but they definitely made an impact as the top heel faction in WWF when the company were continuing to do big numbers every Monday night. The good thing is, I'll soon be approaching all this in the Reliving the War series on the channel too, so if you want to follow it all with a lot more detail then check out RTW every Thursday night. 
I'm having fun with these faction timeline videos though and I have a few more planned for the future. So hopefully you'll subscribe and like the video and all that good stuff. But anyway, thank you very much for watching this one. I hope you enjoyed it and take care. We have more folks who signed up at the Hall of Fame level over on the Wrestling Bios Patreon page. Snowy the Duchy, Brandon Green and Stephen McDade. These guys benefit from things like early Wrestling Bios videos, reliving the war videos a week early, and they also have access to the Wrestling Bios arcade series. So if you think that's something you'd like to check out, then head over to Wrestling Bios on Patreon. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel.